Welcome everybody to our deep learning lecture and today we want to talk a bit about visualization and attention mechanisms. Okay, so let's start looking into visualization and attention mechanisms. So we'll first look into the motivation, then we want to discuss network architecture visualizations. Lastly, today we want to look into visualization of training and training parameters that you've already seen in this lecture. And in the next couple of videos we want to talk about actually the visualization of the parameters, so the inner workings and why we would actually be interested in doing that. Lastly, we will look into attention mechanisms, so this will be the fifth video of this short series. So let's talk a bit about the motivation. Well, why do we want to visualize anything? Well, of course, the neural networks, they are often treated as black boxes. So you have some inputs, then something happens with them, and then there are some outputs. And today we want to look into how to communicate the inner workings of a network to other people like other developers, other scientists, and you will see that this is an important skill that you will need for your future career. So, well, a couple of reasons why you want to do that. You want to communicate the architectures, you want to identify issues during the training, like if the training doesn't converge, if you have effects like dying relus. You want to identify faulty training or test data, and you want to understand how, why, and what networks learn. So there is three main types of visualization that we want to cover here. This is the visualization of the architecture, the visualization of the training, and the learned parameters and weights. And this is then important, of course, for visualizing the representation of the data in the network. But I don't think anybody believes that layer 150 of the ResNet uh, is a grandf grandmother cell and you know layer 100 is contours or something like that. So let's start with the network architecture visualization. Here we essentially want to communicate effectively what is important about this specific type of neural network. The priors that we actually impose by the architecture may be crucial or even the most important factor for good performance of a specific network. So mostly this is done in graph-based structures with different degrees of granularity. You will see some examples in the following. And actually we've already seen this quite often if you compare to our set of lecture videos on neural network architectures. So there's essentially three categories. There is the node link diagrams that work essentially on neuron level where you have nodes as neurons and then weighted connections as the edges. And you've seen them, especially in the early instances of this class, where we really go down onto node level and where really all of the connections matter. They are, for example, useful if you want to show the difference between a convolutional layer or a fully connected layer. So this is essentially important for small subnetworks or building blocks. And there's different variants with explicit weighting, recurrent connections, and so on. If we want to go for larger structures, then we use block diagrams. And there we have solid blocks, and they then often share only single connections between the layers, although actually all of the neurons are connected with each other. We have seen plenty of these visualizations, and here you can see a visualization for the block diagrams. Here the block is a mathematical operation or a layer. Then you have arrows, to, they show the flow of the data, and the blocks can have different granularity. Often they use hierarchical descriptions, and you may even want to use this in combination with the previous type of diagram, such that you make sure which block does what kind of operation. And of course you need a textual description for the hyperparameters, the filter sizes, number of filters, and this then very often is done either in the caption or you add small notes which filters are actually used or how many activations and feature maps are used. We can see there's quite a variety of visualizations depending on what you want to show. 
These are two visualizations of AlexNet and the top one is actually from the original publication and it highlights that it is split into two parts because it runs on two GPUs and then you have the interaction between the two GPUs highlighted by connections between the two branches shown on top. Now the bottom visualization rather focuses on the convolutional neural network structure and the pooling and convolution layers and then in the end you go to fully connected layers connected to an SVM classifier. So here more the concept of the architecture is in the focus while both of the images actually show the same architecture. You've already seen that there's also block variants. So you see here the visualization of VGG where the authors wanted to show that they have this decrease in spatial dimensionality while an increase in the interpretation dimension. So here only 3D blocks or cubes are used for the visualization and here they convey the idea that you want to switch from spatial dimension to interpretation. There's many, many different ways of visualizing things. You should pick the one that shows the effect that is important in your opinion and then you add a good textual description to that one. So the key is in the combination of text and figure in order for others to be able to follow your ideas. There's of course also libraries that have tools that display the actually implemented graph structure but it's not so well suited for conveying the information to others because many details are lost or sometimes the grade of granularity is just too high in order to show the entire concept. So this is typically good for debugging but not so good for reports or conveying the idea of your architecture. Well, there's of course also other visualization strategies and here we just have a short overview of what can be done. There are things like GraphCore Poplar, which has this fancy graph visualization and you can see that this is a representation of the architecture, but it's not so useful if you try to implement it after this visualization, but it kind of is interesting to look at it and to try to understand which part of the network is connected to which one. You can clearly see that the layers can be identified here. So the different layers and configuration of layers form different shapes, but generally it's very hard to look at this image and say, okay, wow, this is a ResNet 50. Uh, if I, I would prefer a different visualization of ResNet 50 in order to figure out what's going on. Maybe back in here. And I know this is gonna look like we're destroying everything. Don't worry about it. We don't make mistakes. We have happy accidents. Well, let's go ahead and talk a bit about the visualization of the training. And this is also very crucial because it has lots of interesting information like the input data, images, text, um, the parameters, the weights, the biases, the hidden layer data or the output data. And of course, you want to track somehow what happens during the training. So this tracking helps in particular for debugging, improving the model design, we talked about these effects already in the lecture video series about common practices. So here is a very nice visualization of training shown in the TensorFlow Playground. And this is a very interesting tool because here you can not just visualize the connections, but you can also visualize the activations of a 2D input in terms of the input space. If you go back to the very first lecture videos, you see that we actually used similar representations when we were talking, for example, about the tree structures. So here you can see during the training over the iterations how the representations in the different layers change. And they do that by a visualization of the division that is created by the respective activation function in the input space. So you can see the first layers using fully connected layers and sigmoid or activation functions, they essentially generate like partitions, binary partitions of the input space and then you combine the layers over the layers and then you see how these different partitions of the input space can then be assembled to form a more complex shape. 
as you can see here on the right hand side. This is typically limited to 2D toy examples, but it's very nice to follow the concepts and to actually understand what's happening during the training. You can run a couple of iterations, you can accelerate, decelerate, stop the training process, and then look what has been happening in the different steps of the training. So this is nice, but if you want to really look into large problems, then things like the tensor board are really useful. And here you can monitor the actual progress during the training. And this is definitely something you should use when you train large networks. Because here you can see how is the loss behaving on the training, how is the validation loss, and so on. And you can visualize this over the entire training. And you can really use that to see if there's convergence or to detect if there's something wrong with your training process. You already run like 100 epochs and nothing is happening with your loss or you have the exploding gradient happening and stuff like that. You immediately see that in visualizations of TensorBoard. I'm a patient man. That's what 19 months in a Vietnamese prison camp will do to you. But I will be watching you, studying your every move. Okay, so now we already discussed several different visualizations, in particular of the architectures and the training process. Actually things that we've been using all the time, but I think you should be aware that the way how you visualize things is very important if you want to convey your ideas to other people. What we'll talk about in the next video is actually then visualizing the inner workings of the network. So we'll look into techniques, how to somehow figure out what's going on inside of the network. And these are actually quite interesting techniques that are also very useful for debugging and trying to understand what's happening in your network. And we will first start in the first video with a short motivation and some weaknesses of deep neural networks you should be aware of. So thank you very much for listening and see you in the next video. Bye bye.